Okay, welcome everyone to another week of the Behavior Evolution and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every Monday at the FM here in this room at this time. And before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to give you a preview of uh, next week's talk, which will be the last one for the quarter. Raziel Davison is coming um, from UCSB. The talk is entitled Evolutionary Retrospectives on the Human Life History Trajectory. Um, the list of speakers for spring is up on the website at beck.ucla.edu, so you can visit it there. Um, and there's a sheet going around, a sign-in sheet. If you haven't already signed it, please do. That helps us keep track of attendance and things like that for our funders and other people. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dan Frischka, who's here from the um, Arizona State University School of Human Evolution and Social Change, and is going to be talking to us today about what it means to replicate studies in a cultural Thank you for the invitation um, to come talk to you today. I believe this is the first time I've ever been to UCLA, and so I'm very happy to be here um, for a number of reasons. One is that, as I've always looked from afar at UCLA, I've seen it as a place that has a long tradition and a critical mass of folks who, are, who have experience using systematic methods in um, truly diverse populations around the world. I'm going to be talking about that today, and so I'm looking forward to hearing feedback from all of you um, on some of the questions I raise at the end. Uh, I would be remiss in not, dis in not mentioning the conversation partners I've had over the years uh, who have helped me think through a lot of these issues, including um, my collaborators at the, the LAM um, Project for Health and Development in rural northwest Bangladesh, uh, including not only my collaborators, but the participants who I am thankful are oftentimes willing to laugh at what I propose when we are proposing a method or a workflow or, or a stimuli um, in, a, in a study or a way of asking a question who are willing to tell me um, why it's wrong and are willing to work through solutions about how to do a better job of asking questions and uh, running studies. Um, in addition, I'd also like to thank uh, the lab members of the, uh, the Culture Change and Behavior Lab uh, who um, are, are really important for thinking through a lot of these issues, especially Leo Tjoken, who, by the way, from the Netherlands, I think he's in the Netherlands right now, uh, says hi and that he, uh, um, he misses being here. So, um, and I should also add that he, more than anyone else from the lab, has been the one who's pushed these conversations about robustness and replication in science and got me thinking about this when we're trying to apply this in cross-cultural settings. So what I'll be talking to you today about grows out of a number of different um, research threads that our lab is engaged in, all aimed at developing locally meaningful and globally comparable measures for the human sciences. And this includes work on moving beyond what we find in demographic and health surveys where they normally assess material wealth using an asset-based measure that really just reflects success in the cash economy and ignores the agricultural economy. And so developing measures that work across a wide range of countries that also assess success in other dimensions and other livelihoods. And also work in biological anthropology, um, trying to identify how well-established differences in human body form, which biological anthropologists have known about for a very long time, can bias public health measures of what counts as obesity or what counts as stunting in children or what counts as wasting. Um, the work I'll be presenting today is in that same spirit, but it's focused on how uh, when we take psychology experiments and, and modes of inquiry in psychology and the social and behavioral sciences, how do those translate across settings? And how can we come up with, not, not to just throw up our hands and say it's impossible, there's no way we'll ever do this. I have faith in human understanding that we can actually communicate um, in different ways, even communicate through scientific protocols. Um, how do we derive um, comparable workflows and measures and approaches to studying people so that we can c compare across societies and cultures. So th the premise of the talk today is that, and many of you have heard about this, that replication is in the air. Um, this is a big thing not only in the social and behavioral sciences, uh, but in the biological sciences. Uh, it came about for a variety of reasons, realizations, for example, that a lot of well-established findings don't always replicate. Uh, and also a number of, of uh, findings of fraud in the early 2010 um, period, about eight years ago. And so 
What's happened since then, there's been a big push for replication. Uh, there's been uh, the large reproducibility project which in psychology, which many of you have heard about, 270 authors 100, examining 100 published results. The Many Labs 2 study, which has 186 researchers across 36 countries, not only examining if papers or findings replicate, but also what are the contextual factors and the cultural factors that affect replication. Journals are beginning to give incentives for replication. And if you look at NSF, currently there's a bunch of new NSF funding, dear colleague letters, and uh, reports and guidelines coming out about improving robustness and replicability in the social and behavioral sciences. I should add briefly that although similar problems have been observed about generalizability, <laughs> there haven't been the same push in effort to assess generalizability of findings. And we can talk about why that might happen. I expect it has something to do with the cost of research, that it's much easier to take a workflow that's been developed in a psych lab in the United States and transfer it to Bulgaria or to Nigeria, um, to another psych lab in another psych department in those countries. Uh, but we can, we can talk about that later. And the important thing is people are calling for this stuff. Uh, and a key part, and I mentioned workflow, a key part of replication is the notion of a workflow where you take something, you do something to it, or you take people, you do something to them, uh, and something happens. And so I want to go back to the 1660s, um, many years ago, at the kind of the cusp of alchemy to modern chemistry, looking at Hennig Brandt, when he um, was the first person to discover phosphorus. And he developed a workflow that seemed to work. Uh, he started with 5,500 liters of human urine. You allow that to putrefy. You boil it into a thick syrup. You distill red oil from that. And then what's left at the bottom of the beaker is uh, a black substance on top of a white salt. You separate that black substance. You combine the red and the black. Then you heat this mixture at very high temperatures for 16 hours. And all of a sudden, you get 120 grams 120 valuable grams of cold fire, which turns out later we understand as the element phosphorus. An important part of this is his theory sucked. He had a horrible theory as to why you should do this. His theory was that urine is yellow, and thus it must contain trace amounts of gold. And he was looking for the philosopher's stone. And so he figured if, if I apply different types of processes to this, I can identify the philosopher's stone. He, did, he failed at that, but he actually created the, the, a workflow that identified the first modern element um, in the origins of chemistry. People knew about gold and silver, but this was the, the first one um, in modern times. So his theory sucked, but the important thing is he developed a workflow that was replicable. You could change certain elements, like you could use human or animal urine, it didn't matter. You um, could uh, change certain aspects of it, and it didn't matter. But certain things had to remain the same. Uh, I will just let you know certain things didn't have to happen. Then later they found this out. So for example, you did not have to let the urine putrefy. That was not an essential part. People took it out. The white salt at the bottom actually contained the most phosphorus. And so later when they folded that in, you were able to usually magnify seven to tenfold the amount of phosphorus that you got at the end. But the important thing is it was a replicable workflow that he could apply in the same circumstances, get similar results, and share it with his peers. He took six years to share it because he wanted to keep it to himself. He thought he had found the Philosopher's Stone. Um, but when he shared it with his peers, they could replicate it as well. Now, we have workflows in the beha social behavioral sciences. This is a diagram which is intended to capture many of the kinds of workflows that we use. Um, some, we just, first of all, we always have to convince people to enter our workflow, right? No matter whether we're doing unobtrusive observation or not. That would be unethical otherwise. Um, so with unobtrusive observation, you go right to recording behaviors or responses. In many cases, um, scientists decide to discard abnormal responses, and I'll talk more about that later. Analyze results and then records, and then you get results. In other situations, we might be doing a survey design where we give instructions, we introduce stimuli, maybe questions, maybe hypothetical scenarios, and we ask for responses, and then we record those. We might randomize this, and so that then becomes a behavioral experiment. Um, and I'm happy to talk about the other kinds of scientific workflows this leaves out, but I think this captures a number of those. The, the problem with such workflows is that many treatments um, in, in psychology uh, 
make it sound like this is really easy to simply translate these workflows to new settings. Uh, you just put it in a suitcase, maybe with a phrase book, and then you're fine. You handle the linguistic issues. So maybe you just, in one of it literally just says, well, all you do is you ch just change the participants and keep everything else constant, right? And that would count as a replication with a new population. Um, maybe it's just a language issue. So we're always saying to translate and back translate. Uh, or maybe just assess the equivalence of responses to standard formats like Likert or multiple choice questions. And um, this is an example, I should add, these are really important efforts in science to do replication and understand the contextual influences on findings. This is the many lab study which includes 144 samples, 36 countries. Um, and on the surface when you look at that you're like this this is really going to show us more about contextual variation. But then you actually dig deeper and look at the range of contexts which are involved. Well, one good thing is the countries involved, although 53% are European and Anglo-dominant colonies like the United States and Australia, um, there are 17% from Latin America, 14% from South Asia and East Asia. Um, this is much better, for example, than the representation of studies you see in psych science today. So in that sense, it's good. But then you look at the other cultural factors that these people are exposed to. 59% are still part of subject pools. So they're, they're from psychology departments where they have subject pools. Um, if you look at the settings, they were all in the lab or at a computer. 86% uh, of the samples mean age was less than 25. And if anyone's ever worked um, in a setting with older individuals, like in rural Bangladesh, the, the, the demands of, of working with, um, with that demographic can be quite high in terms of making sure that, um, that people understand and that people are willing to participate. Um, and then if you look at the languages, because language is an important part of experience too, I, I would assume. Um, most of, half of it is English, 38% is other European, and then a small representation of Chinese, Turkish, and Japanese. Um, and then the last thing, which um, Rick Klein was very nice to send me just this morning uh, when I asked him about it, because it wasn't actually reported in the study, is that if you look at education of the populations, 74% have at least some post-secondary education, so they're college students, and 26% graduated from high school. There were like 21 who had lower education. So while these are extremely important efforts to look at replication, they're still replicating on a, a population that has a very specific cultural upbringing in an institution that's spread around the world, which is universities. So um, what does it mean to truly replicate studies in a cultural species where we go beyond um, a certain set of humanity. Um, and an argument I'm going to make is that common scientific workflows, and this is not a new argument, this is an argument that goes back to Florence Goudinov when she was talking about intelligence tests and how there is a select group of items that have been identified as being good at testing intelligence among middle class white kids in the United States, um, and that that was a culturally constructed <coughs> process. Um, but going through the last century, many people have made these arguments that Common scientific workflows are constructed by a unique set of humanity that is scientists with their own intuitions about what's going to work, selected to generate results on a unique set of humanity. And what that comes with is we build in a tacit set of assumptions about human perception, responding, and behavior. And another argument that many of these folks have made is that this is not just a methodological problem. This is a theoretical problem about what is the same in different cultures around the world. Um, we're usually, ha we have our eyes on the prize on the interesting theories, like evolutionary theories. But if we can't even get people to respond the way we might expect them to in the workflows we've designed, I would say we, we need to work on that as well. Um, and so it limits our ability to test the interesting theories, but I also think it limits our gaze to the fact that all of these problems in identifying what is the same across cultures and when workflows don't work and they fail, that also is an interesting theoretical problem. So scientific workflows, again, are cultural constructions. And today, I'm going to talk about some of our own experience in Bangladesh with the issues of giving instructions and introducing stimuli. And then also in terms of discarding abnormal responses and deciding what is abnormal in different cultural settings. So there are many trivial examples of where um, the same means different things and different stimuli mean the same things, right? And so in Cyrillic, the pi symbol there um, would 
elicit the same response as the P symbol in Latin. And then the, the P symbol in Latin is going to give a different response than the, well, it's actually the R symbol in Cyrillic. You can go to words, and if you say ne in Swedish, that means no. In Greek, it means yes. So you're getting the exact opposite response. Um, and then you can go to hand gestures uh, and even head movements. So, for example, in Bangladesh, it took me a year to understand when I talked to someone and I asked them what we should do and is this a good idea? And they were like, I was like, does that mean they don't want to? And they were like, then they said yes. And it turns out that that is the way you're like, sure, yeah, why not? So um, even moving your head can be interpreted in different ways. But as I should say, these are, these are the trivial problems. Like these actually have been worked out in a lot of cultural psychology. Um, but there are also differences in incentives to participate. So Charles Briggs has a great example of his own work in northern New Mexico where he had a very hard time getting elders to communicate about wood carving because he was treating them in a way that actually was a sort of, he was treating them as if he was the dominant person in the interview. He was asking questions whereas he needed to be listening. And so learning how to interact in a way that in incentivizes people to participate is something we need to think about. Um, what counts as an unethical incentive or something that will cause strife in the community? In my community's money causes strife, so we can't use that. We use rice. Um, but there's also differences in incentives to uh, speak up to a researcher. So Mystery and Rogoff have a great study of kids learn, uh, representing what they learned from a narrative. So it's about memory. And it turns out that the kids in one population said very little. It wasn't because they didn't remember it well. It was because it wasn't appropriate for them to speak a lot in front of older individuals. And so these incentives really matter, and we have to learn more about this. And that's not just the si stimuli, it's the incentives. There's been a lot done, and Don Campbell very early on um, raised this question of if we see differences cross-culturally, to what degree are they due to perception and understanding? And there's been a ton of work on language. Uh, and um, some work on issues of the dimensional dimensionality of stimuli, um, and then also even uh, researcher questions. So a subtle change in a researcher question might lead to a different end result. Um, we know very little about the differences in practiced activities across different cultures and societies, what are familiar and unfamiliar materials, and then also patterns of response. So the degree to which people are likely to respond in extreme ways on, a, let's say, a liquored item, or how they treat each question is independent or non-independent, something I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, whether it's even acceptable to kind of entertain a hypothetical or that's something people are used to. Uh, the, these are all differences that are more than just differences in stimuli. And so we have all these cultural differences. And if you think about the production of workflows as a cultural selection process, you get a wide variety of workflows that are generated by a specific set of researchers using symbols, language, and practice routines to elicit responses that they hope will teach them something about the people they're studying. It goes through what you might call the undergrad or the weird sieve. Um, and the question is, does it efficiently generate useful data with numerate, literate, uniquely educated, and urbane populations? And then you get a series. These are just stimuli and, and measures. But you could ask the same thing about every single aspect of that workflow um, and what's been selected for. And some of the aspects of the population that this has been selected on, um, so uh, reading, most of them are able to read and write from left to right rather than up to down, familiarity with large numbers and 2D geometric figures, willingness to entertain hypothetical vignettes, obedience and willingness to suspend disbelief about the researcher's requests, assuming that they're a, trusting, a trusted individual. And these are just a few of the, the possible differences. Um, so I want to give one example of this uh, to illustrate how it's more than just the, the stimuli or the language. So this is a very interesting study that just came out two years ago um, on a group of um, Zambian children. Um, and the reason the researchers were, they were studying a, a pattern recognition, and the reason they were studying this is increasingly um, agencies, international agencies, are interested in testing interventions um, aimed at improving cognitive ability. And so you need measures to identify if the interventions are working and when there are certain populations that need more intervention, that this is the, the goal. Um, and so oftentimes what they'll use for a pattern recognition task is something like 
a blue circle that allows the, 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 the kid to look at these patterns. So a blue circle, a red triangle, a yellow square, a blue circle, a red triangle. What comes next? So who thinks the next thing is a red triangle? Who thinks it's a yellow square? Okay, you guys all, you guys passed. <laughs> High cognitive ability. So um, the problem is, is that when that was applied to the Zambian school children, um, although the researchers knew they're actually pretty good at pattern recognition in everyday tasks, they did really miserably. In fact, only 13% of the kids, um, and the, the black lines here represent their score out of, out of 10, so 0 to 10, only 13% of the kids got more than five of the questions, 50% of the questions right. So they were wondering, well, maybe we should make this a little more f familiar for the kids. Maybe it's a problem with dimensionality or familiarity with the, the, the items. And so what they did is they did the same thing, three dimensions with toothpicks, rocks, beads. And when they did that, there was a remarkable increase. So now you had 36 to 38% of the kids who were um, at least getting five right. And this is the distribution, so it's a marked increase. Now, both of these are intended to capture cognitive ability and in terms of pattern matching. Um, and I think they both, at the surface, look like they would. But there's other intervening variables here that somehow create very different results, which raises really interesting questions about, we know that in the Zambian children, that that task is somehow different from that task. Those are not the same task. It'd be interesting to bring these back to, let's say, US children where these were originally developed and say, well, how does this task <coughs> produce different results? Perhaps it's the same results. Perhaps they're not sensitive in the same ways to the dimensionality or familiarity of the methods. So when we see results like that, sometimes I hear this a lot, is that, well, we just need to figure out how to deal with these nuisance variables, right? So these are just nuisance method artifacts. And in the past, there's been lots of folks who have talked about cross-cultural differences and blaming them on failures of communication, of interpretation, of controlling the situation. Um, but if we look back to, Rosin has some propositions about psychology, which I like to go back to. The principal aim of psychology is to understand how humans and animals behave, think, and feel, and how these events influence and are influenced by their material and social environment. Well, I contend the material and social environment includes the scientific workflows researchers present to participants. So we need to understand that as well. That should be a, a basic theoretical concern in the social and behavioral sciences. And if we can't get that right, how can we be trusted for anything else? Um, and then the other argument is that that means that tacit, untested models of the universal respondents are embedded in these workflows. And paying attention to these failures and recording them and observing them and sharing them um, is a, a useful way, I think, to develop, uh, if not a theoretical understanding, at least understanding of the regularities um, um, by which uh, people perceive and respond to stimuli. I'm going to give one more case study. I've gotten very interested in Likert items <laughs> over the last two years. Uh, they, partly because they're the most culturally successful scientific, social scientific method um, currently. Um, they were developed in 1932, so just under about 100 years ago. Um, uh, Renzis Likert developed them to understand people's attitudes about race relations, um, and there were a few other pressing issues at the time he was trying to understand. Um, and the principle is, you uh, give people statements, let's say about race relations, and then you ask if they strongly agree all the way to they strongly disagree, or strongly disagree all the way to they strongly agree. And then you combine, you average these items, and it tells you something about individuals' attitudes. Um, so if you look at these, somehow these aren't showing up. This does show the rest of the world on my PowerPoint, so I'm not sure why it doesn't. Um, th this is actually a plot of um, data from a paper by Rad et al., 2018, um, where they looked at what was published in Psych Science and where the majority of papers were coming from, even in 2017, 16, after um, the work by Joe Henrik and also statements by uh, papers by Ross and many people saying that we need to expand. Even then, 95% were in these places. And that's where most people use Likert items. 
They do sometimes branch out to college-educated populations in the United States, and very rarely do also, uh, they also uh, branch out to other populations. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but if you go to the demographic and health surveys, which I work with a lot, and they do sometimes ask questions about attitudes. Uh, and when they do that, they do not use liquored items. They'll ask about attitudes about female genital cutting, about um, domestic um, interpartner violence. Uh, and when they do that, they use yes, no. And there's no documentation as to why they choose yes, no. I did talk to someone recently who, who uh, works with DHS, and they mentioned you know, this was something that we could get to work in a lot of places. And so there seems to be a cultural divide between places where yes, no works and liquor items work. Seems to be. But we don't know. And the reason is we find people who say there are high refusal rates and, and people favor yes, no. We have anecdotal reports from the field. Some people saying they work, some people saying they don't work. We have the, the longest running set of surveys in uh, low literacy, low income settings that decides to use yes, no questions. Sometimes they work fine though. So um, in some cross-cultural studies, uh, for example, the many, um, uh, the many um, labs project, they use liquid items with very few problems. And also cross-cultural studies by some esteemed colleagues here. Uh, and so they work sometimes, sometimes they don't. And the issue is we don't know when they do and why they should and what are the regularities, what are the contexts in which they do or they don't. So what populations and also what domains? Because since Likert developed the scale, it's been expanded not just attitudes, but judgments of frequency, judgments of likelihood, judgments of, um, of, of beliefs, a wide range of questions and subjective judgments. So I hope I've convinced you now that this is something that is worth looking at and, and, uh, and investigating in greater detail. And I'm going to describe two case studies from the work I've been doing in Bangladesh. And it's focused on um, this regularity called social discounting. I got interested in it um, doing, after doing my dissertation on friendship. Uh, I wanted to do more cross-cultural and comparative work on friendship, but I realized using the term friend to operationalize these relationships is a really bad idea. And the reason is the radius of what counts as a friend varies linguistically. So Russian term from drug might actually constitute a much smaller number of people than the English word friend. Um, there's a, yeah, so, um, so I, I wanted to go to something else that we might be able to compare across cultures. One was this notion of social distance and closeness, which has a long history in anthropology and psychology. Uh, and uh, when I came to, oh, you can't even see that. Oh, that's tragic. Okay. Um, there's so many studies there. Okay, and anyway. Uh, <laughs> So this is, this is a, um, a chart made by Leo Tiokin for a paper that's now in press um, showing um, how social discounting has been replicated and what is social discounting. It's as people's judgments of how close they feel to an individual um, increases, they're more willing to sacrifice an amount to give that other person some amount of money or rice. Um, and so this is the amount foregone to give someone else a certain amount of, of, let's say, rice or money. And this is the social distance. So this is the closest individual. This is someone who's at a distance of 20. And you see this steady decline. You actually, this has been replicated in the United States and also college-educated ed populations outside the United States over 50 times. And it's in, not only is it a replication of effect size, it's a replication, actually, of a pattern, which is um, hopefully more convincing than just like, it's, you know, this is the effect size. Um, and if you saw all these lines, they would all be showing that same downward direction. Because of this replicability, uh, you find many people now, some um, citing it as a law of giving, uh, and also discussions of underlying neurophysiology. Um, but the question is, are these premature? Um, so far, it's really been only tested on um, college-educated samples and mostly uh, folks from weird countries. Um, I got interested in this because I was actually interested in contextual factors affecting parochialism, like how, what is the slope of this? How does religion shape the slope? Um, how, does it, uh, um, how does economic circumstances shape the slope? Um, what I, I found out later that was probably the wrong way to go. Like th that, was, that was like um, Hennig Brandt assuming that urine would turn to gold, right? Um, <laughs> But it led to some interesting things. 
So the first part is how do you assess closeness? Um, so the two standard approaches to, selecting, uh, uh, to uh, measuring closeness in literature are um, Arthur Aaron's inclusion of other and self scale, which comes from social psychology. Um, and the way this works is you show the individual seven um, overlapping circles. This is self, this is other. And they have to think about their relationship with a specific person. Um, and then they, then they choose the set of overlapping circles that best represent their relationship. This is supposed to represent the most closeness. And then this is supposed to represent the least close kind of relationship. Social distance comes out of another tradition in psychology based on temporal discounting, so uh, Racklin's work. Um, and the way that that works is they actually ask you to imagine a football field. And the person at the one yard line is the closest person to you. The second yard line is the second most close. 50 is someone who's an acquaintance. And then 100 is someone who you've uh, maybe only met once or, or never met. Um, and so that's a measure of distance. The question is, how do you translate these into a place like rural Bangladesh? So I just described to you the, the approach that Racklin et al. takes. So imagine a list of 100 people closest to you in the world, ranging from your dearest friends or relative at position one to a mere acquaintance at 100. And then, then they ask, OK, choose person one, choose person two, choose person five. So how does this translate? Um, first of all, as in many languages, you can't use the same spatial metaphor. So when we were talking to people about the relationships, they did use the word kachi, kachi um, bontu, uh, a near friend, um, which literally is, means near. So it's a spatial metaphor. But they didn't really use it. Um, they didn't use it for, I sh shouldn't have said friend here, because they usually only use it for kin. Okay, so that's actually kind of a, a bad phrasing. You wouldn't say kachi bontu. You can say prio bontu, which is first friend. Prio means first, but that really only gives you the first, right? It doesn't give you second, third, fourth, fifth. One phrase that they used both for kin and for friends was gunishto, which means thick or viscous. It comes from a root meaning viscous. And you'll find in other languages, for example, in, in Dutch, I believe it's um, dika friend. Um, does anyone speak Dutch here? OK, then I can just say anything, right? <laughs> um, so thick friend, in other places, you'll find different metaphors, um, which raises questions about, is it the same exact thing? Um, so you have to do more interviews. And when we asked people to talk about their relationships, what we found is when they're differentiating between the gonishto and non-gonishto friends or kin, while well, you're supposed to help and you expect help from the gonishto kin and friends. You can talk about important and sensitive matters. Um, you feel comfortable around this person. You enjoy visiting this person. And so these are the kinds of things that mimic people's descriptions of friendship in our own society. I was kind of puzzled by this because in the book on friendship, I wrote, not all societies require that you share important and sensitive matters with your close friends. But it turns out here, that's, that's something that people do. So. As we were exploring this, I, I would be remiss in not mentioning the team that's involved with this. Um, and they're a highly trained set of researchers who, as I said before, are willing to tell me when I'm saying something that doesn't make any sense. And so, for example, I love this scene where, um, where Halida is kind of saying, this is not going to work, right? She's, she's pointing to me like, this is something we have to change. And then she goes back. This is during piloting. Um, <laughs> And in terms of how we do piloting and identifying problems in communication, part of it's proactive. So we're, we always do cognitive interviewing. I would say three quarters of the time I spend in Bangladesh is actually spent piloting <laughs> interviews to make sure that they work uh, before you set them on, you know, wind them up and let them go. Um, so proactive, does this make sense? What are we asking you to do? This is before we ever even run the protocols. Um, we do cognitive interviewing. And then also reactive. So being careful to hear when someone says bujna, which means I don't understand, long hesitations. Laughing out loud happens a lot, where people are just like, what are you asking me to do? Um, and so oftentimes they say, what am I supposed to do? And so paying attention to people's responses during piloting, but also asking them pointed questions is a good way to learn about this. It not only identifies problems, but also sometimes points towards solutions. And just to give you an idea of the cultural selection process that we went through 
to identify a, a way of doing something like the Arthur Aaron overlapping circles scale, um, we went through five different iterations before we ultimately arrived at something that worked. So we started with this, and this just made no sense to people. We, we talked, they were just like, what are the circles again? And what are the overlap? And then the visual field, like, does it even make sense that these are really divided up? I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't make, it didn't make any sense to folks. Um, so all those things I talked about in terms of reactive, bujna, I don't understand what you're doing, laughing out loud, it's like, what are you confronting me with? So then we changed it to stick figures, which we hoped would actually represent people better. Um, but when we did this, there were also issues of, I think, conflating hierarchy. So people started thinking about, um, like, uh, and I'm not even sure why that happened, but they started talking about authority relations with individuals in a way they hadn't before. We, we tried this, but once again, I think the visual field, it just wasn't clear what was distinct and what people were trying to, to um, uh, paying attention to. Like, maybe these are the two things they should pay attention to, or these are, it, and so, we finally hit on the idea, after, and this took two years, um, we hit upon the idea of having buckets where we had photos of individuals and you'd say this is the closest individ set of individuals, these are kind of middle closeness, these are people who are just acquaintances and then everyone else is varying levels of gonishta. And still we had problems. The insight came, and this, this literally took two years in the field, Maybe I'm wasting my time on simple things. Uh, is a simple spatial shift worked. And so we now rearrange it so instead of having the buckets in front of the people, we turn them this way so that this is the closest to them and this is the farthest. Um, mind you, remember, gunishta is not about a spatial metaphor. It's about thickness and viscosity. And yet when we did this, it worked. And unfortunately at the time I didn't know I was going to be studying how cultural selection of tools work so we don't have actually data on the time it took people to do this. But when we did it this way, there were a few questions, little hesitation, fluid responses. Um, they could assign 150 photos in five to 10 minutes. Super easy. And then we had cross-measure reliability. So if we asked about closeness in other ways, so for example, we asked people to take the 20 closest individuals and then rank them this way and choose one, two, five, 10, 20. Um, we ended up getting um, cross-measure reliability and also external validity. So when we compared these to other types like giving um, or helping in naturalistic contexts, we found that these were highly correlated. Um, and uh, also we had the expected associations with genetic kin on average. Not always, there can be tension between genetic kin, but on average, and also with spouses. And important that this was just one part of the entire workflow that we worked on. But when we developed this workflow and brought it back to the United States to work with undergraduates, so here we did a cultural selection process of a measure that started in US, among US undergrads, brought it to rural Bangladesh, went through the cultural selection process, brought it back, we ended up getting results from the undergrads which were nearly identical to what they'd started with, which I think is an important part of this translation process to make sure you didn't just create a cultural selection selected tool that doesn't tell you the same thing as it originally did. So what we learned from that was, first of all, we were asking people to do a bunch of unnatural tasks, which to them just didn't make sense. So the idea that moving from left to right, even when we did buckets, that left to right somehow meant differences in magnitude. It was the spatial arrangement that ultimately mattered from close to far. And then apparently natural generalizations um, which we would have never expected. So the fact that the spatial metaphor works while we're asking them to do this, even though the linguistic way they describe it is gonishta. So that's something, so th I think the point is that with the current state of our knowledge today, um, it can be very difficult to have a priori predictions about what's gonna work and what doesn't work. So now I'm gonna talk briefly about abnormal responses. Uh, so this is how do you discard responses that or allegedly abnormal. And this is related to how we decide how much people are willing to sacrifice for the other person. And this is the standard approach in the Racklin and Jones, where you say, you will make a series of judgments based on your preferences. On each line, you will be asked if you would prefer to receive an amount of money for yourself versus an amount of money for the person listed. And they can choose, here's one choice, $80 for you alone, 
$75 for Sally, $70 for you alone, $75 for Sally. This remains constant, and this is what changes. When we did this, we had to use tickets. So we gave people two tickets. And so for example, this is $2 for, two uh, bags of rice for you alone. This is five bags of rice for Sally. And then they would take one and put it in a lottery. Everyone knew what a lottery was. They loved lotteries. Um, put it in a lottery, and they knew that that could get picked out and paid out. The other was put in the trash. Um, so there was no way that that would get paid out. Now, in the literature on social discounting, and also temporal discounting, any type of discounting, the expectation is that people will be consistent responders. So for example, if I was deciding whether to take a half kilogram of rice for myself or five kilograms for Anise, then oh, I might give it to Anise. That's pretty efficient, right? So I would just be giving up half. Maybe I'd even give up one. But then I get the two and I'm like, you know what? I'll take the two kilograms of rice for myself. If I do that, I should also keep the three kilograms of rice for myself and the four kilograms of rice for myself. And this is a consistent responder. This is an inconsistent responder where they went from self to other to self again. They have what's called two crossover points. And the common practice is you just throw those responses out because obviously that person didn't understand what they were talking about. There's discussion in the literature on temporal discounting how these people are cognitively deficient or they, don't, um, they, they, they have poor IQ than other individuals. And when you look at most current studies, the number of inconsistent responders is about below 10%. When you go to the Indonesia participants that Leo Tiokin collected data on, almost everyone was an inconsistent responder. In Bangladesh, people look like inconsistent, they look like consistent responders unless you looked at those individuals who gave something. So if you give nothing, it's easy to be a consistent responder. But as soon as you looked at those individuals who gave something, there were high levels of inconsistent responding as well. So when we get many responses that don't fit our theoretical models of how people should behave consistently, it could be a problem with our participants. Maybe they just don't understand. It could be a problem with the task. It could be a problem with our underlying model of how humans respond to stimuli. Um, and a key underlying assumption of this is that people have a constant utility function that includes themselves and others, and each decision is independent. When you talk to people, and I talk to people in Bangladesh, you'd oftentimes hearing them say, well, I didn't give up one kilogram in the last decision, so I'll give up two kilograms this time, right? Definitely not independent. Um, we also found the same associations of amount foregone with other variables among both consistent and inconsistent responders when we had a combination of those in our samples, and also a higher probability of sacrifice at lesser amount sacrificed among inconsistent responders. So there's certain things that even though they're responding inconsistently, they're doing other things that we would expect. Um, and this is just a phrase that I heard many, many times, which is kichu dao, kichu now, which is um, give some, take some, or, or yeah, so give some, take some. And so this is how they approached it. Well, yeah, I'll give him $2.5, but well, I'll, I'll take $2.5, but I'll give them the $25 there, and then I'll um, take $10. And so it's, it's kind of giving back and forth. And like I said, the external validity um, was not compromised, even in the Indonesian sample, where you have um, almost everyone responding inconsistently. This is the relationship between relative need of the recipients, which we expected to be correlated to how much they'd give. Um, the slope for Indonesian is actually even higher, meaning the effective need is higher. So it doesn't seem to be attenuated by some random responding bias, which the, which the uh, uh, respondents are engaging in. So what do we learn from this? Um, respondents may not treat each decision as independent and apply the same utility function to each decision. Um, it doesn't seem that a single crossover point appears to reflect most participants' patterns of responding. And we needed to develop a new way of analyzing these unanalyzable responses because we couldn't find a crossover point. And so we had to develop our own new ways of, of assessing amount foregone um, for others. So, those are the two case studies. I want to finish with a few thoughts on where we might go from here. So it's not just like we should just give up because everything's not comparable. Um, first of all, social scientists who've been um, 
working in diverse populations have had many recommendations about how do we build workflows in di different settings to make sure that they're comparable. Um, and some key attributes of those suggestions are observe locally relevant context activities and materials, engage in structured conversations about how key concepts are related to other concepts, investigate the meaning of the methods through cognitive interviewing. These are kind of common sense, so I feel kind of silly even mentioning these. Um, there are analytic solutions. Local relationships with researchers are, are really important to make sure you're having someone tell you when you're doing something that's kind of crazy or that won't work in the situation. But the fact is, although we have these suggestions, I would say we're still in the kind of pre-scientific alchemy stage of developing these workflows. And so I have a few proposals. One is to continue doing what many of us are doing already, which is continuing to reach out and uh, listen in local contexts about the workflows we're using to come up with better ones. And once again, the map doesn't show. Ah, it's so great. It's an awesome map too because it shows the size of the populations, not just, so it shows a big balloon right here with China and India, right? Because, and, and anyways, ah, uh, I'll send it to you later. Um, but these stars, if, you, if I looked, I was really excited to look at UCLA and also look at ASU. If you combine those two, I would say, powerhouses of doing this kind of research, we're covering that entire map that's usually ignored by the social and behavioral sciences. And so continue reaching out with systematic methods. Systematically study workflows. There are debates about the best way to do this. Some folks have argued for homegrown workflow, so go to local context, grow your own workflow based on that. I don't have a strong intuition about what's a natural workflow versus not a natural workflow in any context, so I have no bias there, and I'm happy to take weird derived workflows to another setting and see how they work, but listen, right, and listen and learn from other populations. Proposal three is, if we just do this on our own, that's not going to teach us much, and if we want to come up with regularities, we need to share what we found. So. Um, one exciting resource that's been developed for one very minuscule part of workflows, which is survey questions by the CDC and a number of other federal agencies, has been set up specifically to catalog um, what is known about how questions, what they mean in different contexts and what they mean for different individuals. And they also provide tools for cognitive interviewing and learning about how people respond to questions and workflows. Uh, and so, that ends with a wish, which is, my wish isn't necessarily for theory, high theory or models. I think we're in the age of exploration here rather than in a mature science, but this is an exciting time to, to, to be doing these things, is to just understand the regularities to help us build better workflows in diverse settings. If you go back to the liquid item, which we've had, presumably we should know the most about, right? Because it's been around longer than most and it's used by, um, more scientists than probably any other social behavioral method. Um, so 87 years later, we know some about response biases and extreme responding and how that can make it look like there are cross-cultural correlations when there really aren't or cross-cultural differences. Um, but we still don't understand why. Why, for example, in low-income, low-educated settings do you find more extreme response bias? Um, and we don't know when and why people prefer just to not even respond to the liquor items. And so um, we're still in a very early stage, even with some of the best vetted methods. So what does it mean to replicate studies? This is the question I started off with. Um, what does it mean to replicate them in a cultural species? Well, we don't know yet. And most workflows still suffer from this problem of being culturally selected to work on rarefied populations with baked in ideas about how a universal respondent should perceive and behave. But I think there's a number of proposals that I would make for how we can get to a better understanding of the regularities cross-culturally in, um, in uh, these very basic aspects of workflows. And I thought I'd end with a few discussions because there's a lot of experts here who have done many hours and years of piloting their own workflows. Uh, what are good ways to share our experiences translating workflows? What other strategies can help identify what is the same and comparable when translating workflows across cultures. And this is important. This last one is really important because we're already making really costly career decisions to go to far off places and um, 
produce studies at rates that are maybe like one-tenth the magnitude of folks who are working in labs. So how can we make recording and sharing these straightforward and simple and also incentivize them so that um, people actually are willing to take the time to do this? Um, so with that, I want to say thank you to all my collaborators and thank you to, to all of you for listening and I, ho I hope great feedback on the proposals. Brooke. Um, thanks. This is, this is really, really stimulating. So I'm thinking about what it means to be an anthropologist versus a psychologist working in a, you know, working with undergrads. And one of the things that I've encountered is that, so if you're running a site study with a bunch of undergrads coming in, the, there's a clear hierarchy in terms of you're the researcher, you're asking them questions, they're going to give you the answers, right? And you touched on this when you were talking about the difficulties in trying to talk to elder participants, right? But as anthropologists, we go into these communities often in our first encounters saying things like, I'm here to learn from you, right? I'm, you know, I'm interested in understanding how they work <coughs> in this particular place and things like that, right? And so one of the things that I've encountered when I've um, tried to run some of these studies is that um, there's a, there's an underlying agenda that people have. So you you de design some ex some experiment or some yet study or whatever it is, right? And you're presenting it, and you're trying to get it X. And there's something else that they think is a really important message that they want you to understand. If you're really going to understand this phenomenon that you are here, that you say you're studying, then the really important thing is for you to understand X. So like when you were talking about the um, the allocations back and forth, right? That that the, the money allocations that it flip, it might be flipping back and forth because the thing that they want you to understand is sometimes we give, sometimes we take, right? And it doesn't all have to always be equal in terms of money. But the important thing is that you understand that this kind of you know imbalanced reciprocity or something exists, right? And I've had similar things where people are are want me to understand like, okay, you're asking this, but. I'm answering it this way, and, the, and, and then I start to understand, oh, the reason they're all answering it wrong in this way is because they're trying to make sure that I understand this other thing. And mm. I think that that's a problem that anthropologists who are immersed in their field sites for long periods of time are actually going to encounter more, because I think the community is more invested in us understanding what's going on in a way that they wouldn't be if you were kind of some random person who dropped, you know, helicoptered in and ran your psych study in, in a, a non-weird population. And that, that's speaking to the importance of relationships. And they're willing to actually educate you. Right. Uh, I would say other advantages to having those long-term relationships are um, them, so Bangladesh is a situation where status matters a lot in terms of who's allowed to speak and who's right. Um, and so cultivating a relationship where people are willing, even folks in very poor villages, to speak back to you and say this is wrong is, takes a lot of, so I think that's another reason relationships matter too, is just people not just educating you, but also saying you're wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you're, you're pointing to the importance of relationships, is that correct? Yeah, or? Well, and I'm also just wondering if, like, how, it may be a barrier that is specific, like, it's a bit, it might be a, actually a bigger barrier for the people who are doing long-term field work than the people who are not, in a way. Oh, okay. If, because if you're just dropping in and you're doing it, then they may, may be like, fine, I'll just do whatever you're asking and I'll answer it the way you want. But if you're there huh. and they really want you to understand, they're invested in your understanding, then they may actually not be fulfilling the experiment in the way that you want them to because there's this underlying thing. So I think it's just yeah. thinking about how do you understand that that's going on and then, and then figure out a, a workaround so that you actually can still get the answers to the questions that you originally intended while still being able to absorb the kind of ethnographic context and other information that they're trying to get at. So the argument is that the people might respond differently if they're confronted with a psychologist, and that might even be more, Maybe more, Maybe more accurate in some ways because they're not trying to teach you. They're just it's their first response yeah. rather than an educating response. If it's not a problem of understanding and things yeah. like that, but I, I see, don't know. that's I a great understand. hypothesis. These are the kinds of things I think we need to have hypotheses about as we explore what can be affecting our, our yeah. 
what should we call that? The, the getting getting educated hypothesis, or <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes. So, thanks, Ann. <clears throat> really stimulating stuff. Um, I, I see this, what I'm going to describe, as a complement to what you're presenting here. But I think, it, and, and I know that you already know this, but um, given that we have students in the audience here and, and that there's a larger audience beyond this room, I think it's important to discuss this also. And that's the earlier stage than what you have presented here which is what you might think of as the very initial design phase or the, even the project selection phase, right? Where I, I think it's important, and granted, once intuitions and suppositions can be wrong in this regard, but it's important to try and assess in advance the likelihood to which, that the likelihood that the questions which participants are being asked could be construed in other ways, that there are possible responses that, that, that go beyond the frame of the experiment or that involve the relationship with the experimenter or that involve aspects of interpretation of the dependent measure or whatever. Um, so I think here maybe a, a useful, and I, I present this because I think it's illustrative, not because I'm advertising it, but work that Greg and I have done on, on decisions about laughter, right, where participants are being asked to categorize laughter in particular ways. They're presented with simple forced choice decisions. The stimuli are sort of self-evidently recognizable, hmm. and the kinds of questions that we're asking people, like are these people friends or acquaintances, while potentially subject to, you know, the complexities that you've described with regard to differences in friendship, nonetheless, we're dichotomizing it in a way that a lot of those yep. complexities are not going to be an issue. Does that mean that you know you shouldn't be sensitive to feedback from the participants about you know things going awry, right? So you know hesitation, confusion, laughter, etc. No, I don't think it does, right? Um, but and that is, you should be sensitive to that. But I think you can reasonably anticipate sometimes the extent to which things will be readily translatable across dramatically different cultural contexts and when they won't. One caveat to that, I think, is that, um, that confusion from participants or apparent confusion is not necessarily a sign that the method is going wrong. And here I would, again, just yeah. because this is work that I happen to know well, I would take another example from some stuff that I've done. And that's comparisons on um, uh, foot size, right, proportional mm -hmm. stature. So a asking people to choose the most attractive body. And um, a lot of, uh, anecdotally, a lot of the researchers on those projects report that people say, well, they're all the same. What do you want me to do here, right? Or, you know, how should I know, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and that kind of thing. And that actually, that's not an indication that the method is going awry. It's an indication that the hypothesis is worth testing precisely because the differences are subtle. And if people still express preferences despite that, then it means there's something there. So anticipating that in advance is useful. If you fail to anticipate it, but you attend to the feedback, then you can ask, is this because there's a misfire in the method? Or is this telling us something about the phenomena that we're investigating? So I think there may yeah. Both earlier phase and, and feedback later on is important, and, and that complements everything that you've said here. I think these are both Im really important points. Um, about so, just to clarify, when we have people laughing at the protocols, and that usually happens during the f piloting stage, right? So we we don't include that data other than just to keep track of how the piloting went. Um, so I think it's still an open question how how reasonable our intuitions about what will work are. Um, I, I think that's still open in terms of how, how effective our own intuitions are at generating the right kinds of stimuli. Um, so I, I, I think that's an interesting empirical question that we'll have to ask. Although I think that your mention of, of your protocol for laughter captures a few things which I also expect should work better, which is forced choice situations rather than, so really limiting the degrees of freedom in terms of uh, interpretation and inference for the person to have to deal with. Um, so I think that probably will be an important part of it. Um, and then in terms of the confusion, yes, and uh, we need to talk about different types of confusion too. So there's, uh, we deal with this a lot in terms of discrimination tasks where, um, where uh, 
there can be confu confusion in the sense that people don't know which one to decide, choose. And those we say, do your best guess, right? That's, but there are others which are genuine, much more uncertain confusion where they don't even understand what we're asking them to do. And that, when I say the bujna, that's, that's really what they're referring to. Is it's, it's a more fundamental kind of confusion. Um, but you're right, actually, certain types of confusion, people will be like, you're not going to get any good data from this because no one was able to make a... Uh, they made a decision, but it, it, it was difficult. But then we end up looking at the data, and actually there were patterns there. Um, so, yeah, I think those are those are two really good additions to this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this talk. I was wondering, so in the examples that you showed, um, you were mainly talking about uh, interview type uh, data collection. I was wondering whether you have any experience in trying to make uh, observation-based research more culturally relevant but also so keeping in mind that that is a great question. I don't have a great answer for that. I, I have I've done very little behavioral observation that's systematic in the sense that um, that you might do among the Hadza or um, among the Agta. Uh, and so, but I think there's room for conversation about that in terms of what are comparable observational units, what is equally meaningful in two different settings. I know the Whiting's talked about this a lot in their, their six culture study about um, what are the basic units of behavior and what are the things we need to pay attention to and what's equally meaningful across societies. Um, so I, I don't think that's immune to these kinds of questions, um, uh, but I, I just don't know enough <coughs> about What would you suggest, it, it, based on what I've said here in terms of following the same line of reasoning for behavioral stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always benefited from having a key informant or someone who might also be a translator who you discuss the protocol with and mm -hmm. sort of ask when you think it makes sense to them to record this behavior, but not this type of behavior in order to have a um, coding scheme in a certain way. Okay. So have you used a key informant like that before? Yeah, to yeah. Okay. Do you just use one? Or I do you? Multiple okay. I found that when I have just one key informant, sometimes I don't get, like, I, I make some mistakes. So, uh, so a key informant that helps you design the study, but also helps you interpret the results and how to code the, the different types. Okay. Right. What, I'm curious about when you, when you work with this key informant, do you... Um, communicate to them the goals of the study so that they understand what your theoretical and empirical goals are to help them help you? Or, yeah? Well, in the situations in which I've done it, that, is always, that has always been the case because they're my research assistants and we've talked about it that my goals. And so ideally, this, this person I think would be sort of a bridge between yourself as a researcher and Okay, so like a bicultural informant who knows something of the science, at least a little bit, and also their own culture. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, really great talk. Um, I think it's a very, very timely issue. Um, and I know you're, you're actually fielding suggestions for types of um, ways of sharing this information. Um, so this might be a premature request, but um, it just occurs to me that in a certain segment of the kind of publication arenas that folks in our field are targeting, it, there's a correlation between uh, more high impact papers um, and the requirements on detailing you know, they're, they're, there's oftentimes a relegation of the methods to the supplementary material, and even then, this may never even be part of the reviewed paper in a sense. Like a lot of the most critical details sometimes about uh, analyzing the likelihood of this case being generalizable and culturally valid end up in the sections of papers that are less likely to be reviewed or critiqued. Um, and do you think that 
and, and even the terminology that we use when we say the study, uh, for example, when you publish a unit into, uh, into a journal that has a, a nice, well-defined research question and methods, oftentimes these are projects that are part of other interlocking projects. And so it's the larger context of your interaction for that, for, for that study in itself is, is, of course, vital to know how you did what you're reporting here. But it could be that you've recently arrived at the field site and you just decided to do 20 social behavioral measures in one day. Mm. Each one of these is going to be in a different paper. And when you describe the methods of your project using this terminology of this study, you might be missing a, a lot of these biases, which, um, for example, the the order in which questions are asked within a study, and that's such a well-known yep. phenomenon, the, the, the ordering effects. But even within a series of batteries of questions and measures where you anticipate probably likelihood of getting really highly engaged subjects goes down for fatigue, yep. do you think there's a need to essentially specify the methods in a greater into a greater con contextualization that allows you to know you know, the, the potentials. I, I think that is really important because it's not only fatigue, there's learning effects, there's contagion effects where people in the community learn, oh, I can make five bucks if I do this and answer in this way, or, oh, I can't believe you shared half. <laughs> you know, like, uh, then other people go in, they take it all because <laughs> they, they realize there's no consequences. Yeah. Um, so, uh, these, uh, so it's not just, it's not just fatigue. There, there's a lot of um, cross study, and it's not just within one field season. Absolutely. We find when we do the same thing after three field seasons um, that people are answering in fundamentally different ways. And so, um, or not fundamentally, but quantitatively different ways. Um, and I actually have a slide here about what are good things to know. And one is the time scale of learning of these things. Um, and I think that's part of it. But it's not just about learning, it's about fatigue as well. What are other things, so fatigue learning, are there other things we might expect would be influenced by running a bunch of studies in the same population? Well, yeah, some of the fatigue in learning, if learning doesn't encompass the interaction, you know, of, of the ordering effect of the, right. of the, of the studies. And, and also, yeah, remuneration, payments, right. ordering in which this has occurred, and those kinds of things. And who ends up joining the study after they learn about certain types of remuneration? Um, yeah, I actually think uh, reporting on that would be very useful. Um, currently, I think that a lot of groups are doing a good job of in their supplemental materials, which are available to reviewers usually, um, r reporting the the details of their methods um, more so than existed like you know ten years ago. I think I think there's progress there, but what what I'm proposing here is not just those supplemental materials reporting the existing methods. It's 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 a big ask. Um, but I think if we don't share that, we won't know, um, is how those methods got created. Meaning, how were they culturally selected in that specific setting, and what was the process by which that happened? Um, so those, that's not currently usually described, as far as I know. Clark. Yeah. Um, thinking about the question of designing materials that get you the answer that you're trying to discover, Science studies, and I think Charles Briggs might be one of them, pointed out that interviews, scientific interviews, or whatever, you know, experiment uh, is a form of a genre. Mm -hmm. um, and that some people might understand that. <coughs> so if you go to college and you know what a psychology experiment is, you may have some intuitive sense of like, this is the kind of thing that I'm supposed to be doing here, right? I mean, as you pointed out, that yep. there's this community of aspects to asking people questions. And so a lot of the questions that we ask, and I'm guilty of this as well, you know, violate many you know, Gricean or other kinds mm -hmm. of pragmatic principles of conversation, right? So, you know, the classic one that I've encountered is when you ask kids a question for which you know the right answer, and they know the right answer, and they know that you know the right answer. And in many cases, you don't ask a child, like, what color is the sky right now, right? Yeah. Um, um, but you might ask them, like, where's your brother? And they would say, he's down by the swimming pool. So it's not like you can't ask a question. Yep. It's just you would only ask a question to which you don't already know the answer. So one, one example of something which is regularly violated in the 
genre of, yep. of interviews, right? Um, uh, and it's an interesting question, I think, like, to what extent do people, even in the United States, understand that genre? Um, and so there's this whole category of misunderstandings that we sometimes call demand characteristics, which I think is not the right word. There's a broader thing of communicative strangeness um, that can lead to people not giving you the answer Right. Trying to get, right? It's not like you want to say a particular thing, you just yeah. want them to tell you what they really think. Anyway, long segue to thinking when we're designing these, you know, maybe one principle is to think about how would you ask a normal person, like what would be the question you would ask someone in the context of normal social interaction that would get them, that you would ask to get the information you want to get, right? right. Um, and design the study that way, right? Yep. It's weird that in psychology we often don't, we specifically try not to do that because yeah. it seems too ordinary to say, well, imagine, you know, trading off the present for the future or something like that. Instead of giving people a series of monetary trade-offs, maybe you could ask a more normal question that, you know, that yeah. you get the information that you're intending to get. And I, I don't know, it's yeah. just interesting. So, so I... I this is really important. Charles Briggs' Learning How to Ask is one of my favorite books. I mentioned one of the things from, from that book, the, talking the word carvers, but I think this speaks to a larger issue of the, um, every individual in any culture has an expectation about the kinds of social situations they'll be in and the kind of social expectations about that situation. And we move in our own culture between different situations where now it's okay to make up stuff because we're playing with our friends, or now, now we actually have to be uh, truthful in what we say, and, that's, and so these maxims sometimes differ based on the context, but every culture, my bet, is, has different expectations of when, of how frequently they will run into these. And so asking what is normal is going to require a lot of work on identifying the distribution of those situations, when people learn that they're in a certain situation, and when certain social expectations are of it. It's all, it almost goes to Mike Coles and Sylvia Scribner's ideas of like um, uh, a, a theory of situations that we that we need to have, which we don't yet have, I don't think, cross culturally. Yeah. Yes. Yes, this was terrific, uh, and you you tied it into the general anxiety about replication, which so far has largely been a statistical discussion, amazingly, and not the discussion you're having, but. You, but by glomming onto that, I think we can make progress here. One of the advantages of your work here is that you've identified chunks of thought and behavior, workflow. For example, how many research papers have we read lately that say, here was my workflow, and here's its history? None. Or not in that format. Yeah. Um, another, of course, is piloting. Um, Exploration, discovery, errors prior to the study that you're presenting are almost never part of the study. But of course, they can be the most important part of the study. If you have a beer with psychologists, they'll often tell you that you know the piloting was like the hardest thing. To do. Right. But you'll never hear that unless you have a beer with somebody because they'll never report. Uh, in in child development field, in, in the journal child development. We tried to change the criteria for publication. This is true of other developmental journals, I think other fields as well, to just say more about the population. Now mm. it's quite fine to say demographic. You have a few sentences about demographics. Cross-cultural research says, I have a study I did in Turkey, Kenya, Bangladesh, and that's all you know. Literally, that's all you know about the population. And we tried to make a rule that you had to say at least one or two paragraphs about who these people were. Who were the kids? Who were the parents? Who, yep. Where was the school <laughs> that you're studying and so on? There was so much resistance to that. You, you can't believe there were debates about whether that was appropriate and you couldn't publish it. But it would be disclosure oh. something that you couldn't disclose. Finally, this was put into place. So, so some of the things here. Who are the people that we're studying? What was your workflow? What was the piloting? These are chunks that could be made part of uh, research uh, presentations. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's a way to get into the problem of publication and career commitment. 
and what you have to say in order to have done an appropriate study. Um, when I've reviewed things in the development, I, uh, child development, I sometimes say, this is a very interesting study, but it's an N of one design. Hmm. That is one culture. So this leads to a lot of pushback. And it, an unknown it culture. It gets the conversation. It gets the conversation. An unknown culture because that information is always given. So you don't even know what culture. You don't even, you don't know, even know, what know what the N is. is. Yeah. So, so I think this kind of work can lead to people saying, well, what was your work for again? You know? And which is currently unavailable, really. Um, you mentioned the six culture study and using behavioral observation. So um, if you study a, a, a kid's daily routine, a family, a, a community daily routine, of activities. Who's there? What's their task? Uh, what's the purpose? Um, uh, what's the script for the conduct that you see before you? Um, and then you compare that to what people say. You can make progress with some of these things. So when we worked in Kenya, we repeatedly found in behavior observations that older kids were taking care of other kids. All the, just a high proportion of the time. When you talk with mothers about their parenting, they say, well, I'm taking care of the kids. Oh, I'm there all day. What they meant was that one of the jobs of parents is to assign somebody to take care of the kids so they were there socially and in terms of their structural role, but they're not there. Yeah. They're off somewhere else. Right. The market. So you have, so, but you can connect these topics together by doing direct field work behavior observations, yeah. which which I think are valid and reliable because you know who the kids are and you know their ages and where they're from, and you can just describe that, and then try to figure out why. And that can, in that field, at least, that can get you a long way to identifying what is known or unknown about a situation. And that speaks to the importance of behavioral measures when you're asking people to report on their behaviors. Yeah. Because if you, hadn't asked, if you hadn't observed them, you would have never figured that out. You have to do the same yeah. Up, yeah. Then you can go into yeah. one of the topics you're raising here. Yep. So, uh, but you have to do field work. Yep. You have to be there. Yep. So one of the messages maybe you didn't emphasize enough is, in psychology, were they there? Mm -hmm. Are they actually yeah. in the field at least some of the time? If no, then they've, they've left out an entire domain here, which is yeah. part of your, what you're requiring. Were they there and the were they, oh yeah. The last anecdote I'll, I'll say is that uh, in 1960, John Whiting and his colleagues uh, wrote a research proposal, which was to fund 100 field sites around the world to study child development in 100 sites to be sampled and they went to Ford Foundation and the government, and they got five. And that was the basis of the Six Culture Study. So my question is, what if we had 100 places around the world sampled with local collaborators and all the things you did in Bangladesh? It would be fantastic. And part of, the, part of the work you had to do was to show that you had gone to at least some of those places and replicated what you did in the U.S. or, or in a first world weird country. So th this has been tried, and to this day, we don't have such an infrastructure yet. And it would be a lot more costly than the reproducibility project that has 100 yes. samples. And so um, I'm not sure who would want to run that. <laughs> I run studies with seven cultures, and that's like enough for me. Um, but uh, I, I think that's a noble goal, and maybe not um, a single project, but the goal to reach out more and and do these kinds of things. I was actually, I mean, making an Excel spreadsheet now of uh, anthropologists and psychologists, cultural psychologists, who have applied systematic methods in um, diverse populations. And currently, I'm up to about 100. I thought I would be to a lot more. And I've, I, I've not been selective. I've, I've been including a lot of people in this room here. And so it's like, and that's since Herskovitz, right? That, that, that's since like the early perception studies. And so it's not even like we have the person power yet 
to do that. So I think it's going to require training and bringing people into the fold and uh, reaching out. C can I add one more? Th that's a great set of um, observations. Um, in terms of the uh, talking about the cultural context, I want to make a plug for this paper by um, Rad et al., including Jeremy Gingis, where they um, explored what's happening in psych science, actual journal psych science. And what they found is that um, there's been a big increase in the use of online studies. So it went from 5% over two years to 20%. And it's actually had the perverse effect of describing less about the cultural context of the participants than it used to because you don't know what the cultural context of mTurk <laughs> users are. And so the use of online samples has actually led to less information, like you were saying, is really important, which is, is, is troubling in terms of conclusions. Yes? Uh, oh, oh. For me? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, yeah. Topic. Um, so I kind of had a question about um, collecting data online. So have you thought about, you know, do dynamics change when you, you know, it's one thing to think about how you go into the culture and have these relationships and how you develop methods. But if you are designing something for online study, the community is much less defined. So is the, are there different dynamics of how to approach something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I still... When I think of MTurk, I still think of a guy in a beanbag smoking a doobie and like <laughs> and answering questions. That's my view of the MTurker. So I but I don't know like what that, but probably there's diversity, right? Yeah, there's yeah. Diversity you don't know. Yeah, there's diversity you don't even know. You don't even know. Um, yeah. so I, I would say uh, I, I don't know how to handle that. Um, I mean, right now, psychologists uh, who use MTurk and other people who use MTurk, I've used MTurk. Um, we use these checks to make sure people are actually paying attention and doing what we've asked them to do. So you put in trick questions, and if they respond the wrong way on several of them, then you kick them out. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the limit of people's approach to this currently. Um, I do think that it's dangerous to assume that online samples, like from India, that's the more common one because there's a lot of Indian MTurkers, uh, mean anything like what Miller and Beresoff might have found when they were doing work in Indian cities, um, because that's a different set of people who have different competencies and different training and backgrounds. So I, I think there's a danger there to assume that folks you're finding online, regardless of what country they're from, are, uh, are representing the country that you think they are. Was that, does that help answer your yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, first off, really interesting, um, super productive conversation. I was wondering, um, you know, I was thinking back to the slide you had about the, the guy with the, you know, trying to make the philosopher's stone. It seems like a lot of this um, also is predicated on, on thinking carefully through your theory and thinking about like which points of articulation ought to be sensitive to cultural variation versus not, which, you know, should be translatable. And, you know, to that point, I think there's a, a entryway for, for the role of, you know, graduate student training and pedagogy and sort of what, you know, how do you think that these sorts of discussions ought to influence the kind of training that graduate students receive in order to do better work, because it seems like, you know, there there's so many demands in mm -hmm. the the market that basically push that sort of careful thought to the to the margins really and emphasize just high productivity. So that, I mean, do you think that there are you know ways that this discussion can inform graduate education to you know build better workflows? Yeah. So. Um, that's a real, that's a really important and difficult question. Uh, uh, I believe that um, any any student of mine who wants to study humans has to have worked in some non college, non U.S. setting at least for some period. Even if for uh, most of their career they end up not doing that, they will have been exposed to trying to make these things work in those settings and understand how they don't. Um, and that, that lesson will stay with them for a very long time. Um, so I think just making, <laughs> saying if you want to do this and you really are serious about it, you need to go to other places to understand and, and try these out. Um, because I think that's the best way to learn it, is to realize, wow, this is not just academic. This is like real. Um, 
I think uh, teaching the range of systematic methods and um, right now it's very hard to find so Cole and Scribner 1974 is still my go-to to for a compilation of the way things might break down and how to deal with it experimentally I think it's kind of strange that there's nothing been um, written since then. Most of the stuff since then has been more cultural psychology focused on um, using like items with college educated populations in places around the world. And so uh, a textbook that actually brings together the cumulative knowledge we have working in more diverse populations would be really useful to expose people to the dangers of not taking that into account. Um, in terms of theory, I'm really agnostic about theory uh, because I still think we're at the cusp of this alchemy to scientific, we're still in the age of exploration. I think theories can be motivating the same way that the theory that um, Hennig Brandt had was motivating, even though it was completely wrong. Um, it led to a discovery. So I think theory is important for motivating people. I currently, for example, evolutionary theory, I think underspecifies any of this stuff in the same way that Physics underspecifies it, uh, under, and chemistry underspecifies it. So um, we're really in the age of exploration. If you think about it, W. H. Rivers was the first person to really take systematic approaches to studying people in other cultures, and that was just about a hundred years ago. Um, Brandt came up with phosphorus in 1669. And that was after many years of fiddling around, alchemists fiddling around with this stuff. And only in 1869 did Mendeleev actually make sense of all the things people discovered over that 200 year period. So I think having patience and understanding that this exploration is really important is also valuable. Um, yeah. All right, thank you.